Some of you may remember a time when the point after in a football game, such as a national football game, mm -hmm. the ball would be kicked through the uprights. No kick me through the goalposts of life, Jesus jokes, please. Just right. leave that for what it's worth. Like that. You kick through the uprights. And in the back, somebody or a bunch of people would have signs that would say, John 316, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and all that believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. And then all of a sudden, the National Football League realized, first off, having footballs bounce off people's heads is not good. They like the balls back for some reason. They cost too much money for the NFL. Right. And they put up a sponsor. Who's the sponsor? All state, right, thank you. Okay. We watch football, cool. <laughs> and then we catch the ball, and of course the sign started to disappear. Now, I think the John 3.16 signs are nice. I think John 3.17 is a pretty darn good sign. Right. For Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. So you can begin to see something in there that's good. But what about a sign for John 3.21? My gosh, John 3.21, for we, <coughs> good one. yeah, you're all looking it up too, huh? Okay. <laughs> no. But those who do what is true come to the light so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. John 3.21, or even Ephesians 2.10, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Not bad. Or another sign that could be kind of cool. Who is Jesus talking to in this portion of the gospel according to John? Ah, it's kind of nice to know who he's talking to. He has been talking to Nicodemus. Remember, Nicodemus is the one who comes. He's coming in the night to catch up with Jesus. He's one of the leaders, and he knows that if he's found out, his people can get on him and stuff like that. But he's got a great inquisitive heart. Later on, he does great things. Jesus' tomb, the burial, etc. <clears throat> Nicodemus comes and asks the question, which is basically, how can I be born again? That's the Nicodemus part. So now you're framed with Nicodemus. Wouldn't it be nice if one of the signs behind the goalpost said, Nicodemus rocks! <laughs> yeah. Why? Because he was not afraid. Fantastic to come and learn what it would be to mean to be one who would live in love like Jesus. What it would take to do that. So you got that. And while this is going to seem a stretch, I'm going to fill the blank in a minute or two when we play with the Ephesians passage. But a great sign would be <clears throat> George Whitfield preaches on and on and on. Now, if you know who George Whitfield is, he's from the beginning of the Great Awakening. He came over from England and has worked his way up and down the coast in the 1700s from like the 1730s on. And he could bring massive amounts of people into the field. People not sitting in churches? Ooh. Going out to hear about Jesus? Ooh. Ooh. Be careful. Ooh. Okay, that was part of the Great Awakening. He's opening up. And, and, of course, another, another great sign would, would be, let's hear it for John Wesley. John Wesley. Oh, did, did you know who John Wesley is? Oh, yes. uh, John Wesley and the Methodists. Oh. But John Wesley never left the Anglican Church. He was always a priest of the Church of England. He came over in the 1730s as well to Georgia to do some missionary work, the colony of Georgia. And there he met the Moravians. He and his brother. And when he went back to England, within the next two to three years, he had that moment at Aldersgate when he had the warming of his heart. I suspect it was not unlike Nicodemus meeting and holding and being next to Jesus. And in that moment, what became known as method of studying scripture, getting together on a regular basis, you, you actually have a, that's a precedent for what you're doing on Lent during Wednesday nights. It's kind of a methodism because you're taking a method to do your study, to get closer, to understand this great and huge mystery that kind of baffled Nicodemus. 
And so we hear, we have John Wesley in this particular moment, around 1738, he preaches an amazing sermon in Oxford where he is, I think, allowed to preach. He may be on the faculty. And <clears throat> the tail end of the sermon features the words in the scripture he's working with. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. That was one of the core remembrances from that moment he had, that warming of his heart moment. And for the past 10 years or so, until I changed wallets, and I don't know why I didn't put it back in, I have kept a copy of that passage in my wallet to remind me about the power of good works, not to gain God's favor, but to live in God's grace, to share that grace as willing hands and arms for others. And we've declared that for ourselves as we began our Lenten disciplines. We did that on the first Sunday <clears throat> in Lent, or no, I think I handed this one out to you on um, the Sunday of the Transfiguration, but it was to get you ready for Lent. The bookmark, stay with me, there are a few copies in the back. The one that says, stay with me and then I shall begin to shine as thou shinest so to shine, to be a light to others. Uh, the prayer of, um, oh, goodness me, John Henry Newman, I think <laughs> I could remember that. And tie that with these words. But those who have done what is true come to the light so that they may be clearly seen in that their deeds have been done in God. So when you begin to think about the Lenten discipline you took on, I didn't put the other bookmark in my pocket, but it's there. Some in the back, the one that Lent is a time of fasting and feasting and thinking about the different ways you could go in creating whatever it is that's going to guide you to better understand how easy it is to turn away from the light or being the light to being the light. That's part of why you gather for studying on Wednesday coming here on Sunday, being nourished in the Eucharist, all the things that can strengthen you to be part to be that light in a world which really seems at times to welcome darkness. And we're pushing back against it. The scripture has spoken to that. Mm. Now, I must tell you, about five years later, John Wesley was asked to preach again. He preached on a regular basis, same, same Oxford, and his sermon had something that his theme was on the spiritual apathy, the spiritual apathy of the leadership in the Church of England and beyond. And guess what? He was asked not to come back. Okay. When we take a look at the psalm that we prayed on La Tierra Sunday, Rejoice Sunday, I am so glad that it ends with, let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and the wonders he has done for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts of joy. Because guess what? The pull to apathy is really easy. Much like the pull moving us away where despair can pull us away from joy. All the reasons we do all of these disciplines is to help us stay open to that where our strength comes from. This is what Nicodemus sensed and knew and found completely. This is what John Wesley had to discover again and then found a way to share it. This is what each and every one of us is called to do. Now, having put myself in the vestments and the lofty company of Nicodemus and God even evoked George Whitfield, the great, great preacher, as I'm attempting to preach and the incredible witness of John Wesley and his powerful pointing to where strength and love comes from. I must now tell you 
that it's been about six years since I've been in a place on the fourth Sunday in Lent when it's time for the bacon story. <laughs> the bacon story. You don't know the bacon story, no. do you? No, if you go back deep enough in my website, you can find previous tellings of the bacon story. But it's always good because I need to be reminded of it as well. So here's how the bacon story works. About um, 11 years ago, I was at St. Peter's in Huntington, West Virginia, very part-time, having finished in, at St. Matthias, Matthews in Charleston, working on my doctorate in the throes of writing and having the whole thing finally come together, which was powerful. And I had the privilege of hanging out with some kids. I like talking to the young folk. Right. They're not afraid to ask good questions. And so I had a small group of kids, they were like eight, nine, 10 years old. And we're sitting there, it's between a service or two, and I'm just in my clerics with the dog collar on, and I, I asked them a stump the priest question, okay? Right. Now, the prelude to the stump the priest question is, earlier in the day, I had received an email from Perry. Perry was a young woman, now probably in college 11 or 12 years ago, now close to, God, I hate this part, 30 years old, wow. they grow up. <laughs> and she had been a marvelous person in that church and she sent me an email saying, hey, it's about time for the bacon story. Because she remembered I did this with the youth group and thought it should be brought out in the world. So that's in the back of my head, that's kind of nice. Thank you, Perry, I thank you for remembering. Mm -hmm. So I'm here with the kids. <clears throat> the first one says to me in Huntington, St. Peter's, do you like being a priest? That's a good question for Stump the Priest. And I was able to say, yes, I think I like being a priest. I get to hang out with you guys and stuff like that. Right. And, and the second one looked at my dog collar and said, does that, how, what does it feel like to wear that? <laughs> so I actually took it off and I let them all put it around their necks. And it's just a way to remind me of how much I need God. And then Fiona, you hear the name Fiona? Fiona's a creative name. She matched. Her name beautifully. She was about 10 years old. So how old is she now? Okay. 30. No, no, she'd be 21. It's 11 years. 10 plus 11 is 21. Okay. Okay, whatever. <clears throat> and she looks at me because she was pretty good. If you know what a non sequitur is, it's you think you're going in this direction and somebody says something from this direction and maybe it makes sense or not. And when it's holy is when they connect in some form. She looked at me having no idea that I had gotten the email from Perry. I think Perry actually did it on Facebook, but an email of some sort. And she looked at me and she said, the other, remember, do you like being a priest was one question. Um, what's the collar like? Her question had nothing to do with, was, do you like bacon? bacon? Where did that come from? <laughs> and so it became time for me to tell them the bacon story as well. And it ties into everything I said about a Lenten discipline. When I was in seminary at Neshota House, we had a refectory. And we would gather as seminarians every day during the week, except for Saturday and Sunday, and have a meal together, having been in chapel earlier. And in a refectory, it means somebody else has done what? The cooking. And so you can go down the line and pick up your food. And at least three times a week, they put out bacon. Now bacon is really fun to eat when somebody else cooks it right. and cleans up after it. And all you have to do is put it on your plate, eat it, and go on. I made the decision in my first year of the three years of seminary, because that's how long residential seminary is, that I was going to give up bacon for Lent. Wow. Well, a about midway into the late third or fourth week of Lent, I finally gave up bacon. Yeah. It's hard. You can see how hard a Lenten discipline is. Mm -hmm. So if you've been having any trouble, so I'll just let you know that it gets better the second year. It only took me to the second week uh, to give up bacon. Good. Even with the best of intentions and calling on God. Third year, on the way to the priest, of course, I managed to make it. The funny thing is about bacon, 
I try to give up bacon every year in Lent just as a connection back. Bacon shows up in food if you're not careful. I remember going to a Wendy's once and buying a sandwich and then looking at it. It didn't have strips of bacon. It had little bacon bits hidden yeah. in the sauce. <laughs> I won't tell you my decision. <laughs> I think it was on a Sunday and I used the Sunday out. But whatever it was. Okay. The long and the short is to be the light, to live into the tools such as stay with me and I shall shine as thou shinest, to seek the wisdom of fast or feasting, to try to hear the others that have gone beyond and live to their witness like Whitfield or John Wesley or uh, Nicodemus or whatever, the people who are kind of like me and mm -hmm. like you, even the Apostle Paul, etc. But to realize at the heart of it is where the light comes from and that what's preparing us. So I'm going to leave you with one last gift, as I've told you before, another congregation gave me. Is I work with them as a supply priest over a long period of time during a sabbatical of a priest, and I learned the prayer of self-dedication, and it has become part of me. And my hope is that you find something that becomes as much a part of you that will help you understand and find the strength to seek the light and be the light. Almighty and eternal God, so draw my heart to you, so guide my mind, so fill my imagination, so control my will, that I may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use me, I pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Prayers in the prayer book, right before the prayer of St. Francis. You can't miss it. All these words I offer in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.